Well, good morning and aloha. So for those of you who are coming to Hawaii as visitors, we certainly welcome you here and hope that you'll come back again. Uh, we've got lots to talk to you about, so anytime you come, you are most welcome. Uh, for those of you who are assigned here in Hawaii or live in Hawaii, uh, we're delighted that you came out to spend some time with us over the next few days and to have some good dialogue and discussion. And especially for those who are from other countries, our friends and partners from around the region uh, who've made the journey to come with us, we greatly appreciate that you're here. It uh, makes it extra special, without a doubt. I want to thank Joel Sullivan for the welcoming remarks that uh, opened this symposium and exposition. It is an important event, and the work that the Association of the United States Army does uh, on our behalf, uh, we greatly appreciate. And that includes bringing together an event like this, the second land pack. And so we, we thank you, Chief, for, for that. Uh, this should be a great event over the next several days. And I'm really excited about it. This is my first land pack. It's the second of the land packs. But when I heard about this, I knew that this was something that we really wanted to make sure that it happened again, because it's a very important event for the region, and certainly very important for the land forces of the Pacific. So it's my distinct honor to be the first of several speakers over the next three days who will deliver remarks at this very important professional development forum. And I, I want to share with you this morning a few thoughts and observations, a, a few points about how the Army is engaged in the Pacific how land forces operate in the Pacific. And I very much appreciate the invitation to do so, uh, to speak on behalf of the land forces of the Pacific, and certainly on behalf of the soldiers, the civilians, the families who are part of U.S. Army Pacific. We've got several hats that we're wearing now. Headquarters U.S. Army Pacific is first a theater army that does the work on behalf of the United States Army for Pacific Command and throughout the Asia Pacific region. We've also been designated as the Theater Joint Force Land Component Command, a role that brings together the key parts of Admiral Locklear's land power. U.S. Army Pacific, Marine Forces Pacific, and Special Operations Command Pacific as well. Now this venue that we have helps to bring together Asia and Pacific focused land forces of these organizations, U.S. Army, U.S. Marine Corps, Special Operations Forces, and regional militaries. And it lets us do things like discuss matters of common interest, interface directly with industrial and academic players, and really to build a community of interest around the role of land forces within this internationally important geographic region. Now, the chosen location of Hawaii is uh, not only scenic and historic, it's also very practical. As Hawaii remains home to the largest concentration of U.S. land forces, along with the functional components of U.S. Pacific Command, and it's also the closest state for most of our regional partners and allies to reach. And so it makes sense. We're in the right place at the right time for the second year, and I know it's going to be an excellent symposium. LANPAC provides all of the participants an opportunity to gain insights on whole-of-government approaches, and you'll hear that several times over the next few days, whole-of-government approaches, to hear from regional defense leaders, to hear from industry, to hear from academia, to hear from other governmental and non-governmental organizations. And this insight 
informs our assessment efforts as we try to refine our own strategy to meet the objectives of the defense strategic guidance. Now, in this second year, we've got a, a wider array of presenters and panelists. There's more involvement from industry and academia. There's a higher level of representation from regional countries. And we have another strong representation from our U.S. PACOM land forces and joint partners. And you'll see them coming and going over the next few days. So it's an exciting opportunity. And it serves as an acknowledgement that land forces remain essential to security and stability in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Now, let me talk a little bit, very briefly, about some of our history. I won't go into detail on the history of the United States Army because it is a long and storied history, and certainly the history of land forces throughout the Pacific, but a few things I believe are worthy of note. Uh, first, our experience in the Asia-Pacific region has had a joint and expeditionary composition since the late 1890s. The U.S. Army played a significant role in the region's security and stability then and has maintained a presence since, by the way, earning more campaign streamers, 63 to be exact, in this part of the world than in any other area outside of the Americas. And so the region is not new to the United States Army, nor to the role of land forces. And yet it remains a diverse and challenging region, just as it has always been. In the present time, as the United States reduces the number of land forces that are deployed in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and in Europe, the weight of our attention and our presence returns to the Indo-Asia Pacific region as a part of a strategic rebalancing of our national priorities. And through continued partnerships, the U.S. will invest in diplomatic, public diplomacy, economic, military, and assistance resources in a way that is commensurate with our comprehensive whole-of-government approach. This focus places a premium on the use of strategic land power because the region's primary drivers of human endeavor, interaction, and decisions, things that happen in the human domain, all find their beginnings and their endings within the land domain. Security remains the enabling companion of economy. Economies affect people where they live. Therefore, securing the world's largest populations from external and internal threats calls for increasingly professional land forces. Moreover, the natural disasters that threaten and claim lives every year, especially in this region where more than 80% of the world's fatalities from natural disasters occur. If not effectively responded to, may undermine national security as well as economy. So it's on the land where land forces, the Army, the Marines, the Special Operations Forces, become the key multipliers, a decisive element of American national security, protecting the nation's interests and demonstrating our nation's continued commitment to the region in ways that other means cannot achieve. Now, before I go further, let me describe a few of the environmental factors that impact this dynamic and challenging region and further emphasize the role of land forces in mitigating or responding to these crises. The Indo-Asia Pacific region is, as I mentioned, very diverse, extremely diverse and complex. It's rife with 
potential man-made or natural crises at any time. In addition, it encompasses over half of the Earth's surface, more than half of the world's population, concentrated in only 17% of the world's landmass. It's home to the three largest economies in the world, the four most populous nations, the world's largest democracies. It is nine of the 10 largest ports and busiest sea lanes in the world. These factors help account for $8 trillion in two-way trade within the region and another $1.2 trillion with the United States and over one quarter of the global gross domestic product. But that's not all. The Indo-Asia Pacific is also the most militarized area in the world, with six of the world's 10 largest armies, 27 nations with armed forces, and 20 of them having a chief of defense from an army background. So the long and proud heritage of the U.S. Army and of the U.S. land forces in the Indo-Asia Pacific region, coupled with steps taken over several decades to develop resilient relationships with regional partners, steps to enhance the capacities of partner nations in areas important to them, and steps to build enduring power projection capabilities are all major national resources dedicated to the rebalance strategy. Now, since the rebalance announcement and last year's Land Pack Symposium, land forces have been busy trying to deepen the regional understanding and building partner capacity through leader engagements, training exercises, real-world humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations. Earlier this month, Admiral Locklear testified before the House Armed Services Committee on United States Pacific Command's posture and he highlighted a few of the many great things that land forces are doing throughout the theater to support peace and prosperity. For starters, while still supporting our friends and allies in the region, our relationship with China has increased across all levels of government. Land force engagements with the People's Liberation Army are a, an important part of our military to military relationship. And this dialogue can provide a channel of communication that remains open when tensions emerge in other domains. Our pursuit of this channel of communication does not in any way displace our existing treaties, alliances, or relationships. Rather, it adds to the existing framework, a framework for dialogue among the region's militaries and nations. So here are a few examples of these channels of communication. Between August and October of this past year, soon after the U.S. Army Pacific uh, Command elevation to the four-star level, USARPAC had the privilege of hosting the People's Republic of China Minister of Defense and a military delegation here in Hawaii. And that was part of a, a broader PACOM hosting and subsequently a larger U.S. visit. And we participated with China in a quadrilateral disaster management exchange in New Zealand. And we hosted a bilateral disaster management field exchange with 60 People's Liberation Army soldiers, nine PLA generals, right here in Hawaii. These efforts and others aim to increase transparency and to defuse tensions within the region as China continues to emerge economically and militarily. In another example of our actions, speaking more loudly than our words, Pacific Land Forces led the joint team response to Typhoon Haiyan that devastated the Philippines. 
and building on a solid foundation of previous exercises and exchanges with realistic scenarios and the invaluable contributions of forward presence west of the international dateline, PACOM designated Lieutenant General John Whistler, the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force, as the commander of Joint Task Force 505, with Major General Gary Beard, U.S. Army, as his deputy commander. Supported by U.S. Special Operations elements that were already in place working with the Philippines, and by the deployment of key logistical, medical, and intelligence capabilities and communications experts, the Joint Task Force was able to make a significant contribution in helping the government of the Philippines and the U.S. Embassy country team provide relief in the most critical early days of the disaster response. And this very successful operation stands as a testament to the importance of collectively building capacity to respond to crises that are common to most Asian and Pacific countries, including the United States. And it comments to the value of land forces in the region. The modern joint operating environment demands a unity of effort across the various domains, including the land domain, and in that human terrain where USARPAC is the Pacific's sole Army Service Component Command and Theater Army Headquarters, and the lead for the Joint Force Land Component Command works so closely with the U.S. Marine Corps, the Special Operations Command Pacific, to ensure that Admiral Locklear and his Air and Maritime Component Commanders, that land domain combat assets are properly postured across the theater. This requires continuous assessments, especially in light of current operational needs and future contingencies. And achieving the best possible theater set is a joint activity, and PACOM relies on the land component to lead that joint effort in gaining a better theater set. And so the Theater Joint Force Land Component Command is one of the mechanisms that PACOM developed to effectively and efficiently plan for crises and maintain our steady state of land force engagements over this expansive geographic area and to create a more agile and effective mission command architecture that can easily transition from daily routine business to crisis response. In this area of responsibility for Admiral Locklear, we recognize that early warning times are eroding. And essential to our strategic redesign are four tenets, trained and ready forces, cooperative and persistent engagement, agile mission command, and forward presence. These are four tenets that are very important to us. And to address all these tenets, all the services have found ways to employ their forces to better fit the needs and the dynamic nature of this region. The Marines' rotational force deployments to Darwin Australia, the Army's rotational force deployments to Korea, the Army's ballistic missile defense deployment to Guam are examples of new force employment that send a clearly visible message of our commitment across the region. Land forces also support the joint force with critical capabilities and unique functions in the form of Army's support to other services and executive agency tasks, such as chemical decontamination, security of theater lines of communication, psychological operations, defense of forward operating bases, air and missile defense, which are vital to the success of all campaigns, and not only in the land domain, but also the air and maritime and cyber and space domains. 
Later this year, USARPAC will explore a new employment model that works with allies and partners using existing exercises and engagements as our foundation. And in addition to force employment, also critical to the joint force success in the area of responsibility is this effort of setting the necessary capabilities and infrastructure within the theater. In consideration of the tyranny of distance, which we all appreciate, that has always been a challenge for Pacific forces and their ability to respond. The distances are significant, they're huge, it takes a long time, no matter what mode of travel you choose. And it stretches and strains lines of communications, adding to response and transit times. In that regard, in that regard USERPAC is actively engaged in updating and right-sizing Army prepositioned stocks within the area of responsibility to support the joint and interagency operations that we know will come. Our overall strategy for setting and maintaining the theater is based on our support plan to U.S. Pacific Command's theater campaign plan and the guidance and directives from the headquarters of the Department of the Army. And I wholeheartedly believe that we have to support the Joint Force Commander through a purple mindset, not a green mindset necessarily. We bring the green capability of the U.S. Army, but we must see things through a purple mindset, constantly focusing on what is in the best interest of the Joint Team, daily reaffirming our commitment to the success of the Joint Team as an indispensable member of that team. Now, the bilateral relationships that we build with our allies and partners throughout the region are absolutely key to, to mutual defense, but they also form a basis for multilateral security arrangements, going from bilateral to multilateral security arrangements that can actually strengthen the efforts to address Asia-Pacific security challenges around the region. Bilateral relationships, then, are the cornerstones of multilateral cooperation that can become essential to success in responding to the hazards and threats of this region. Land force structures for multilateral dialogue, like this Land Pact Forum, or the U.S. Army Pacific Program for bringing countries together at senior levels on a recurring basis, known as the Pacific Army's Chiefs Conference or the Pacific Army's Management Seminar. And we'll do the Pacific Army's Management Seminar this year in Bangladesh. And General Kareem from Bangladesh is here. These types of events enable dialogue among countries that might not be able to have dialogue in a capital-to-capital -capital type of discussion or framework. And so I'm extremely excited that 13 countries from, out, um, from throughout the region were able to come and join us here at this particular forum, sending delegations to this year's Land Pact. I'm looking forward to the presentations that will be made over the next few days. Uh, those who will play an active role in communicating their ideas and their experiences, we certainly uh, welcome that and appreciate it very much. I'm also looking forward to the opportunity that all the participants will have to interact with industry and academe, to have a direct dialogue, a direct communication of interests and needs and capabilities. And that's what this is all about. So the forum has been created. It's now up to us to take advantage of it in the best way possible, and I encourage you to do that. I do also personally look forward to interacting with you over the next few days and having a chance to share ideas with you, answer your questions, or learn a lot. And I know that I have much to learn from the perspectives that you bring. And so I encourage you to share your perspective with anyone you see here and help us to become a better group of land forces in the Pacific. So thank you very much once again. Enjoy the conference, and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. One team.
going to be doing a, a media event that follows this, uh, but there are some questions here that I can address to the, the, the broader body, and then uh, we'll go from there. So in times of limited resources, in order to avoid, prevent redundancies, can you explain the division responsibility between the Army and the Marine Corps in the Pacific region following the principle of efficient uses of resources? Uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, th this construct of the Land Component Command is the first way to respond to the question. The Land Component Command is intended to create a unity of effort that organizes work being done by the land forces in the Pacific. And while we certainly have a higher headquarters, U.S. Pacific Command, that directs our activities on a day-to-day -day basis, Admiral Locklear believes, and we believe with him, that we can gain greater efficiency in the use of forces through a body that is constantly looking at land force activities and commitments in the region. And so we will do things like look at what engagements are being done by U.S. Army forces with what countries at what period of time, and ensuring that the engagements by Marine Forces Pacific, the engagements being done by Special Operations Command Pacific, are complementing each other. Now, this is particularly important for our regional partners because we can find ourselves creating saturation unintentionally where we have one group coming right after another into the same country, and sometimes training on the same things. Now, there's good repetition that comes in that, but there's inefficiency that comes in that as well. So we find that this approach to having a land component command helps to organize the work that we're doing. Uh, trust me, there's more than enough work to go around. And even though we've seen an increase in the number of Army forces uh, that are assigned to U.S. Pacific Command, rising up now to 106,000 active soldiers, and in close partnership with National Guard from the states along the Pacific Rim and in the Pacific uh, states and territories, as well as a commitment from, a significant commitment from the U.S. Army Reserve, even with those assets available, we've got to organize how we use it in a different way. We also look at when we have operational deployments that are occurring throughout the region at a given point in time by the different components so that they, again, are complementary. So if we have an amphibious ready group from Marine Forces that is embarked uh, aboard the Pacific Fleet's vessels operating inside of the region, unless we deliberately want to exercise together in some country, we will operate in a different region to increase the amount of options available to the Pacific commander in the event that there is a disaster that has to be responded to at a given point in time. So that's really the approach. It's organizing ourselves, having better awareness of what each component is doing at a given point in time, and then actually seeking the harmony that comes through deliberate coordination. Let me, uh, there was a second question here. What assistance is being given to the Philippines now in relation to the work done for the high-end victims? Is there any long-term plan set, or is the work done? What new challenges did you encounter in this experience? I'm going to defer some of the answer to a panel that will discuss that in some detail. Uh, and that will be a very important panel for you to come and listen to, because it will have the leaders who did respond firsthand. And they have the best observations of what was observed on the ground. Uh, but I can tell you the work is not complete. Uh, this is an important matter to understand that while response is absolutely vital, as I express, not only to relieve human suffering, but because it can become a national security issue if not well responded to, the work does not end with the initial response. Now, this is once again in the land domain and then the place where humans live or die, that the work continues. Our efforts, though, are first intended to help a host nation deal with the consequences of not only the disaster, but frankly, dealing with the consequences of the response. So multinational coordination 
became a very important contribution that the U.S. delegation was able to make once committed there, the U.S. Joint Task Force, to assist the government of the Philippines in receiving countries and contributions who came with differing capabilities, differing resources, to get those put into the right order so they could be used. We also worked to assist the country team, as I mentioned, U.S. country team, the ambassador, the Agency for International Development, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, critical partners from the U.S. government in a time of response. And it really was their guideline that told us what support was needed and when support was no longer needed as much from the military. So the continued work in support of the Philippines is done by the country team and through the Joint U.S. Military Assistance Group in the, Philipp in the Philippines as well. We don't have a long-term plan for continued commitments of forces, but we do respond to requests as they come, and I'll leave it at that so that the panel can address it in greater detail when the time comes. Thanks for the questions, and thanks again for the interest. Thanks for your presence, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Have a great day. Thank you.